you hear me? Yes? OK. Uh, so thank you for your interest in my talk. Um, yes, we've heard it before. With the uh, invention of nanomaterials, we have to think in new ways about size, properties, and possibilities. But I would say we should also um, think about ways of the, um, how, to, how to use this material or how to process this material. Today, I want to talk about um, an advanced technique for the um, incorporation of nanotubes of two balls into polyamide 6 and polypropylene. So let me introduce the company I'm working for. It's the business unit Customized Polymer Materials from uh, Lehman & Foss. We are making compounds all over the world. So our business is tailor-made compounds. Um, that means um, we are yeah, product or, or polymer designers. We are choosing a polymer as well as a reinforcement filler or additives and also a process to bring everything together. Um, so how, how does a customization of a thermoplastic polymer usually works? Usually we are taking such an extruder, which is basically a hot barrel with uh, screws inside. And these screws are divided into different sections. Um, the first section is for melting up the polymer and transporting the, the polymer with a filler to the mixing zone, where everything gets compounded. And then we have a discharge area where the raw compound gets uh, out of the extruder, then chopped, dried. And this technique is state of the art, so it's a conventional technique to make um, almost every uh, thermoplastic compound in the world. So now let's talk about filler materials. Um, which kind of fillers do we usually use in terms of reinforcement and especially electrical uh, conductivity? We can use metal uh, powder, fiber, carbon fibers, carbon blacks for some special application as well, semiconductor powder. And nowadays, we are really fascinated about graphite material or graphite-based material. L let me show why. Um, when we have a closer look at graphite, it's made of um, honeycomb carbon lattice, which is stacked together with a certain distance. And if we extract one of these layers, we got graphene. And graphene is supposed to be the strongest material in the world. Graphene has amazing properties, like an E modulus of 1 terapascal, tensile strength 120 gigapascal. So it outperforms steel by 5 to 100 times. Um, it has also really uh, outstanding uh, conductive features, like an electrical conductivity of 10 to the power of 8 Siemens per meter, thermal conductivity about 5,000 watt per meter in Kelvin. It outperforms silver about 20 times. So these are fantastic properties. Um, out of graphene, we can imagine further um, nanomaterials, such as the nanotube. If we wrap up the graphene layer, we got a single-walled carbon nanotube. This is actually what tubal is. And um, due to its origin, these nanotubes, the single wall nanotubes, have really similar properties to graphene. If we wrap up multiple layers, we got a multi walled carbon nanotubes. The problem with the multi walled tube is that it's um, kind of brittle. So for compounding, um, we noticed that the multi walled tube sometimes breaks even while, while we're extruding it. So it's, it's brittle, and it doesn't have such a nice aspect ratio as a single wall tube. So in, in most applications, the single wall tubes is absolutely preferable uh, to a multi wall tube. And um, so far about the background. Now, the white rabbit took us really far into what I call the nano wonderland, because we have fantastic, outstanding properties. But in the real world, this nano material appears as a black powder, because its particle size um, doesn't exceed uh, some micrometers. And how can we now profit from this black powder with a fantastic property in the nano world? So the answer was already given in, in the title. We make compounds. We take a polymer matrix and um, incorporate these nanoparticles. And I want to talk about um, composites made of polyamide 6 and polypropylene. So, now, what happens if we take a polyamide 6 and a conventional extrusion technique to incorporate 
a non-conventional filler to incorporate Tubal. This is the property profile of PA6. So it's an inexpensive ductile material, which has um, a pretty good elongation at break, and it's an insulator. It's not electrically conductive. And if we now add 0.05%, we immediately see a reinforcing effect to the mechanics. And if we keep going, 0.1%, 0.2, we see still a reinforcement, but also a decrease in the elongation of break. And if we keep doing it, now we see that the electrical conductivity is increasing as well. At 1%, we have a pretty nice compound here. Um, it's electrically conductive, it's reinforced, but it has two downsides. It was expensive because, you know, nanomaterials are always a bit expensive, and it's brittle. Its elongation at break decreases all the way. <clears throat> um, to understand why we do have this problem, we can make some um, electron microscope pictures here. And here we actually see what the problem is. All the nanoparticles are located here in the center. So these are actually two balls, nothing else, no polymer inside. And we have white sections on the material where we can't find any nanotube. So it, it, it's, uh, all the nanotubes are located in agglomerates, which are about 80 micrometers uh, big. And this is, a, this is a problem for the compound. Um, so don't get it wrong, extrusion compounds with tubal are still have nice properties. But what can we expect if we use a proper technique? If we are not like what we did now was like mixing already baked bread with berries and sugar to bake a cake. So what will happen if we mix the dough with sugar and berry? If we mix not the polymer, if we mix the monomer with tubal and polymerize it afterwards. So this is what we call the in situ polymerization. <coughs> and this is how it works. We mixed um, in for to, to make PA6, the monomer of PA6, it's epsilon capture lactam at elevated temperatures with tubal, and then we polymerize it in such a reactor. Oh, here we are. So this is the chemical reaction. It's quite a simple reaction. It's ring opening polymerization, good to handle, easy to do. And now let's see what we can expect from this compound. This is the electron microscope picture, and we see here all the white lines actually are two balls. So the two balls are forming a substantial network all over the polymer. Um, and we can expect much more from this compound than an extrusion compound. Um, what in particular? Um, here are the um, mechanical properties of such an in situ compound. We do have the E modulus here in, in bars and the tensile strengths in boxes. And we noticed that even at low filler le uh, levels, we got a reinforcing uh, effect all the time until we almost doubled the uh, mechanical strength of PA6 at 1% tube ball. Um, the elongation at break decreases all the way. This is a typical uh, image because we are incorporating a stiff material to a flexible polymer. Um, so it's decreasing, but it's not that dramatic that we have um, found when we, when we increase other materials such as carbon fiber. So it's, it's still a flexible material. Even if we increase, uh, incorporate 1% two ball here, we have almost 100% elongation for PX6. This is um, remarkable. And now let's have a look at the electrical conductivity um, against the filler content. We see that the in situ compound of tubal and PA6 have a percolation threshold um, about 0.1. And at 0.25, we already get an electrical conductive compound. And if we compare this um, 0.5 with the mechanics, we have a unique compound which is flexible, strong, and electrically conductive. Compared to the extrusion technique, we can see it here, um, it's, it gets much better properties 
Um, so this is a logarithmic scale, and this difference here are about one to two decades. Um, now let's have a look just for you to compare it to a conventional filler with a conventional um, incorporation technique. This is a conductive graphite where we are talking about 15% to see something. All right, so, so far about PA6. Now I want to talk about the polypropylene in situ compounds. Actually, we, we did the same. We mixed the monomer of polypropylene in situ with tubals. The thing is that the monomer of polypropylene is a gas, so this was quite tricky. That's why the first step was to disperse the two balls in toluene, and we uh, found a really nice technique to do this. Um, here, uh, even after one minute, we got a perfect dispersion, uh, which was stable for months. Afterwards, we included methyl aluminoxane to this dispersion, this is a co-catalyst for the polypropylene synthesis. Um, and this is reacting with the surface of the nanotube. And afterwards, we added um, a catalyst as well as the po propylene gas to start the pro poly polymer polymerization. And uh, what happens is that we uh, got grafted structures, so the polymer was growing directly on the nanotube. And let's have a look at this uh, comp compound we made here. Um, we got the same picture like the PA6. We got a beautiful network all over the polymer matrix. It's dispersed, it's, but it's still somehow connected together. So it forms nice uh, path for uh, electrically, uh, electrical charges. Um, and these um, this pictures are promising really uh, interesting features, and we could observe them in terms of electrical conductivity. Here, um, we, the percolation threshold is even lower than 0 0.1. And we also got at a 0 0.25 a nice electrically uh, conductive compound. All right, so give, uh, let me give you a uh, conclusion about this. Um, at the example of, of a composite with 0.5% single wall carbon nanotubes. This is the property profile of PA6. This is the property profile of an extrusion compound of 0.75% um, uh, tube balls, um, which is already pretty good, and they are, they are used for this compound, okay? But this happens if we are using a proper in situ technique to um, incorporate the same amount into, uh, of tube ball into a PA6. So we, we see that uh, the in situ incorporation is a promising way for really effective incorporation. And um, it's, it's probably a nice way for the uh, development of future materials. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, my, name, uh, my name is Vladimir Saik from Axial Group. Uh, I think it's a r uh, pretty clever way of uh, obtaining uh, in situ polymerization of uh, polypropylene. But did you try a similar way uh, for poly, uh, PA6? I mean, uh, uh, when you do polymerization, it uh, it's, uh, occurs at rather high temperature and may cause uh, re-agglomeration of, of uh, carbon nanotubes. So maybe it's interesting way of trying uh, this, uh, like in polypropylene. And, and Did you try it? You, you mean, uh, yes, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's the same um, idea about the in situ polymerization, but the, actually the, the reactor process is completely different. At the um, polypropylene, we have a slurry reaction, which is carried out in, out in toluene all the time. And um, the polymer is formed in, in the dispersion. Um, and the polymerization of PA6, it's in the um, molten polymer. So this is the difference. Uh, 
So my uh, another question is: When you do polymerization of PA6, do you have problem with reagglomeration of carbon nanotubes there? No, no, actually no, because um, it's stabilized by the monomer all the time, and the monomer is transforming into the polymer. So this is the tricky part of it. Thank you. Thank you, thank okay. you, Vladimir. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of more questions. Zahar, please. Yes, and how do you see your business in the future? Will you produce master budgets and sell master budgets, or will you produce spinal compounds or whatever it is? Uh, yes, that's that's a good one. <laughs> um, so usually we are doing in in our business unit we make uh, final products. We are selling compounds, but in the Lefos group we have also a department for master batches, and it's it's probably. Um, we will transfer these results to them to make some master batches. But our problem is that um, we are not so familiar with reactors or making polymers. We are more in compounding. Our business is more compounding. And this is why this topic is really a special thing in our company. Yeah? So w we have to see how we solve this problem. Or maybe we can collaborate with somebody else who is making these this polymers. Thank you. Uh, yeah, more questions. Hello, <clears throat> Diego Santa Maria from CRH. Um, I see that uh, you are introducing in this uh, in situ polymerization the nanotubes, and you get a very typical uh, stiffness uh, change with uh, a transition of the uh, TG, I guess. Have you tried to introduce uh, some kind of glycol which is known to be used to shift back? The, uh, the TG in polymerization when used polymerization in situ? Oh, so you mean... Uh, um, uh, to, ge to generate some kind of uh, chain uh, transfer reaction uh, to prevent this stiffness problem. Um, okay, so for us it wasn't a problem to achieve stiffness in the material. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, but when, when you get material becoming a bit more brittle, yeah. uh, is that... Up to which point do you want to compromise the Yes, the um, so um, we, we didn't do this uh, by using the in-situ technique, so we uh, just added the nanoparticle to uh, observe what happens in the isolated system. Um, but this material is still thermoplastic, and we do have um, several techniques or several additives which can be uh, put in afterwards in the extrusion process um, to make the mater material fl a bit flexible again. So this is um, the, the one of the benefits here, that we have still a thermoplastic material which can be processed afterwards by extrusion with uh, common techniques to, to expand the property pr profile a bit more. And the good thing is um, in, in this compound, we still have a lot of space inside. If we incorporate 1% nanotubes, we still do have 99% of free polymer uh, which makes us really happy because we could... Us also. Also, <laughs> yeah, also okay. Uh, because we can incorporate carbon fiber and whatever we want in, in dosages, whatever we want is. Thank you, Diego. Thank you, Martin. Any... any yeah, Dmitry, please. We need... Uh, sorry, I, I didn't see because... <laughs> yeah, the light goes to my face. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan from uh, Nemo Technologies. Uh, one question regarding the results here are uh, based on uh, injected uh, bars or uh, compressed bars? Um, that, that's a good one. <laughs> um, so the mechanical properties were measured on injected parts, and the uh, electrical conductivity was pressed parts. Yeah. And the last one, have you tested it with uh, reinforced with uh, glass fiber already, or it's uh, the next stage? Uh, this would be the next stage, yes, to, to add some glass fiber. We have a we have couple more questions uh, that he's, direction he's, he's and also this direction. <laughs> Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, he asked one of the questions I was going to ask about incorporating fibers, because I expect that would sort out some of your dispersion problem. But just out of interest, you shared uh, mechanical data for your PA6. Mm -hmm. What about the PP? Yes. Um, so. Unfortunately, at the moment I finished the presentation, um, we didn't have results about the PP, um, because this is quite a brand new topic for us. 
And uh, yeah, but I, I have seen the data, and I can tell you they are also really impressive. Um, uh, like sim so similar. Sort yes, of yes. Thank yes. you. Thank you. And one more question is here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that uh, um, since you have in situ polymerization of PACs uh, with single wall carbon nanotubes, so it increased the mechanical pro uh, properties compared to the extrusion. So what's the mechanism here? It's due to the more uniform distribution of single wall carbon nanotube in the in situ polymerization, or this single wall carbon nanotube uh, helps for the polymerization? Yes. Yeah. Good question. Um, Thank you. So the, um, I think the crucial part is the dispersion. So if we have, uh, we have seen the pictures about the agglomerated um, nanoparticles, um, and in this part, in this agglomerates, these, are, th these parts have to break because there is no polymer inside, and they are basically powder. Um, and this is why the extrusion compounds are comparable uh, compared to weak. Um, the other thing is, um, in the terms of polypropylene, we do have grafted structures, so the polymer chains are on the nanotube. So that's why we do have some kind of a microscopic composite material there. And this leads to, to additional reinforcements. But I would say the, the major part is the dispersion, that we benefit from the dispersion of the in situ process. So you mean it has more uniform dispersion for in situ polymerization? Yes. Right. And uh, it, let's say, will PACs just uh, as you said, maybe for PP it will grow on the surface of the single wall carbon nanotube. Like it's a nucleus, right? Yeah. So that helps also, right? It hel helps a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank okay. you.